and thank you, Claudia. Well, these last two weeks, we've been looking at Daniel chapter 7 and the four beasts which rise up from people living all over the world. Now, these beasts symbolize kings and kingdoms who will arise between the time of Daniel and the end of the world. The lion with eagle's wings symbolizes Nebuchadnezzar and the nation of Babylon. The bear raised up on one side refers to Cyrus and the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The leopard or cheetah with four wings and four heads represents Alexander the Great and the kingdom of Greece plus the four generals who will succeed him after his death. Last week, we looked just at the fourth beast with iron teeth, who John says is an amalgamation of the first three. This fourth beast is Rome and all the nations who hate Christ. It has ten horns with another horn to follow, symbolizing world leaders who have not yet appeared. But the horn who arises after the ten is none other than the Antichrist, who will make war with the saints and persecute us for three and a half years or 42 months. But after all of that comes a glorious, glorious kingdom. And as you can see with all the decorations, tonight we begin our Kingdom Chronicles Vacation Bible School. And the most vital thing that we want to communicate to the kids who will come this week is the importance of entering God's kingdom. Yes. Our passage today in Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through 28 tells us a little bit more about God's glorious kingdom. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 28. Let's read it together. This is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 28. This is the prophet Daniel speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, and its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I was watching... In the night, visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near the one who stood by me and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces tra and trampled at the residue with its feet. And the ten horns which were on its head, and the other horn which came up 
before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise after this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law then the saints shall be given to his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is the word of our Lord through the prophet Daniel. Obviously, some of this we talked about last week when we looked at more detail when it came to the beast and the Antichrist. What I want to focus on today is the kingdom that we read about in this passage. And you can't talk about a kingdom without talking about its king. Of course, every king has an entourage. And in the first part of Daniel chapter 7 verse 9, we see an entourage consisting of other thrones besides the throne of the king. Now, last week, when we looked at the fourth beast, we saw that we had to look at other parts of Scripture, including the book of Revelation, a lot, in order to fully understand who the beast was. Our passage today is no different. Several verses that we just read here in Daniel chapter 7 parallel with Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1 and going all the way through Revelation chapter 5, verse 14. And the first parallel that we see as we look at that other passage in Revelation is with the thrones, which accompany the throne of the heavenly king. The Apostle John even gives the number of these other thrones, 24, and says that 24 elders sit on them. Now, the identities of these 24 elders on 24 thrones is a matter of debate. Some think they represent the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 apostles. Some think that the 24 are just high-ranking angels or heavenly creatures. But whatever the case, this is a very, very impressive entourage. However, none compare, whether it's the patriarchs and the apostles, whether it's angels, none compare to the glory of the heavenly king on his throne. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 calls him the ancient of days. And he is clearly distinguished from the son of man who appears later on in verses 13 through 14. So who is this ancient of days? Obviously, this ancient of days must be God the Father. While the son of man, we'll see in just a moment, is Jesus Christ. And yet, while the three persons of the Trinity are separate, they're separate here, they are still united in one Godhead. In verse 9, the Father's garment is said to be white as snow, while his hair is described as pure wool. You jump over to Revelation chapter 1, and you look at verses 13 through 14. And we'll see that the Son of Man's hair is also described as being white like wool, as white as 
this snow. And that's an important observation to make because the doctrine of the Trinity, which teaches that there is one God and that three persons make up this one Godhead, that is not something that people would make up. Not something that people would make up. We couldn't have made it up because we don't fully understand it. And yet, we believe it because this is the consistent teaching of Scripture. The Ancient of Days, according to this text and others, is not the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. Yet the Ancient of Days is God the Father. And the Son of Man is God the Son. Why? Because they both have the glory of God. Now you might ask, well, where's the Holy Spirit in all this? Well, as part of the Trinity, he is also present. When this scene at the end of Daniel 7, 9, going into the verse 10, when this scene is also described in Revelation 4, 5, it says the following. It says, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, uh, in case you're wondering, the seven spirits of God refer to the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit listed in Isaiah 11.2. If you want to look that up later, you can. Uh, that's another topic for another day. I'm not going to get into that right now. But the point I want to make is that the Holy Spirit is also present in Daniel chapter 7, according to Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, as he is represented by the fire in and around God's throne. Yet the book of Revelation is not the only passage to provide a noteworthy parallel here. The description of God's throne in Daniel 7 also echoes Ezekiel uh, chapters 1 and 10. There we are told about cherubim angels and wheel angels. And you're like, you meant mean wheel or real, Larry? Uh, wheel is, is, is what I meant to say. There's, there's such a thing as wheel angels. And you're like, what? I've never heard that before in my life. I did a study on angels years ago. Ask me about it later. Uh, but uh, uh, these cherubim angels and these wheel angels are also in and around God's throne, according to these passages in Ezekiel. But the idea being communicated by all of this is that God is so much higher, he's so much greater than anyone and everything else, including angels. And this is why the, the four living creatures in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, do not rest day or night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. How often do you recognize the holiness of God? That God is whole, perfect, and pure in ways that you and I simply aren't. Remember the holiness of God. And let that encourage you to always worship Him. To always praise Him. Along these lines, the middle of Daniel 7.10 says, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before Him. While the parallel in Revelation 5.11 says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The Lord deserves to be praised. The Lord deserves to be praised, not only for who he is, but for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in the future. The one big thing that the Lord will do in the future is mentioned here at the end of Daniel 7, verse 10, going through the verse 12. It says, the books will be open, and judgment will come first to the beast, and then eventually all who oppose God and his people. Uh, if you want to, 
just uh, keep your finger in Daniel, but if you want to flip over to Revelation real quick, we're going to look at a couple verses there, and I think it'd be good for us to read it together. Revelation 19, 19 through 20. That's where we're going to start. Revelation 19, 19 through 20. And then we'll do 20 verses 7 through 15 after that in a little bit. But Revelation 19, 19 through 20, we read, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies, gather together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That matches up with Daniel 7.11 specifically. That while the beast and his army, we looked at that last week, and, and, and the beast is powerful. He, he has great influence. Don't get me wrong. He, he definitely does. But he's going to be defeated. His army will be destroyed. That's where we need to find encouragement from. Yes, bad times are coming. And, and, and God wants us to know about that. Okay? But don't be discouraged. Don't get depressed. God wins. And if God wins and we follow God, we win too. Yeah. So that's very, very important to remember. So the beast and his army are going to be destroyed by the Lord. And Daniel 7.12, though, agrees with passages like uh, Zechariah uh, 14, 16 through 21 and teaching that some of the nations who sent men to serve in that godly army who was destroyed... Some of those nations will endure into the millennial kingdom. These nations will more or less play, pay lip service to the Lord during that time. But at the end, in Revelation 20, 7 through 15, if you want to flip the page over. Revelation 20, verses 7 through 15, says the following. Now when the thousand years have expired... Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up to the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the ungodly among the nations who survived the battle of Armageddon and more or less submit to the Lord during the millennial kingdom, at the end of that, will join Satan in one final rebellion after his release. But they will be defeated. Don't get me wrong. Don't get the Bible wrong. They will be defeated, all of them. And everyone from all time who refuse to repent and trust in the Lord will be judged by their works Instead of by the grace found in Christ, which is how we'll be judged, they will be judged by their works. Not a good thing, because they will be found guilty and thrown into a new hell called the lake of fire. God will have justice. He'll have justice. And we should be thankful for that. 
A world without justice, a world without universal standards of right and wrong would be a terrible place to live. Not to mention, uh, people like Hitler not going to hell would be an absolute travesty. The problem we have, the problem I have, the problem all of us had, is according to Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned Amen. and fall short of the glory of God. And sin not only leads to death, without forgiveness, it leads to hell, a place of eternal conscious torment. And so how can you or me or anyone be saved? Daniel tells us. In Daniel 7.13, the prophet sees a vision, not just of the Ancient of Days, God the Father, but of the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is an interesting title. Interesting title. In the most basic sense, probably the sense that's used most often in Scripture, the Son of Man is used to identify someone as a human being. Okay? Uh, the, the Hebrew equivalent of this is used 93 times just in the book of Ezekiel alone. Where the prophet, God calls him a son of man all the time, calls Ezekiel the son of man all the time. He basically is just saying, you are a descendant of Adam, the first man. You are a human being. And that's the way that that's used in Ezekiel. And by the way, uh, every single male human being is also a son of man or a son of Adam. Just like every female human being would be a daughter of women or a daughter of Eve. Yet the Son of Man mentioned here in Daniel 7, 13 through 14 is a lot more than just an ordinary man. The text is very clear. Let's look at it again. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. That means he can fly. By the way, that's what it means. If he comes with the clouds, it means he can fly not an ordinary human being. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him so he can go into the presence of God the Father and not be destroyed. As sinners we would be uh, without God's grace. And then to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, one which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So not only is this a son of man, or a human being that can fly, who has divine power, a God-man, if you will, this son of man is also the long-awaited Messiah, Christ, or king, since he is given an everlasting kingdom which shall never, ever be destroyed. Now here's what's interesting about all of this. Jesus, we talked about Ezekiel and how he was called the Son of Man 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. Jesus is called the Son of Man 81 times in the four Gospels. In fact, Son of Man is the title that Jesus liked to use for himself the most. More than any other, even more than Christ. He called himself Son of Man even more often than Christ. What did he mean when he said that? When Jesus called himself the Son of Man, what did he mean when he said that? Was Jesus calling himself just a man? Just an ordinary guy like Ezekiel? Or is he calling himself son of man in terms of what Daniel says here? Is he calling himself the God man? Is he calling himself the Messiah, the Christ, the King? How is he using it? We well, don't have to just guess. The Bible tells us the answer. Mark. Chapter 14, 
verses 60 through 64, answers this question definitively. Jesus tells us how he means it. Mark 14, 60 through 64. It says the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus. This is during the trial of Jesus before his crucifixion. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he, Jesus, kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Basically the Son of God. He tried not to say God's name. Mark 14, 62. Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He's quoting Daniel. And then the high priest, and the high priest knew he was quoting Daniel. Because the high priest, verse 63, tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? Verse 64, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Jesus was quoting Daniel. The high priest, the entire Sanhedrin, realized Jesus was quoting Daniel. How do we know that? Because they condemned him to death, said he committed blasphemy. Why? Because Jesus isn't saying he's the son of man as in just an ordinary human being. No. Jesus is quoting Daniel. Coming with the power, coming with the clouds, like it says in Daniel. And they said he's committed blasphemy. Why? Because he's calling himself the God man in Daniel 7. Jesus is the Son of Man who is both the God man as well as the Messiah, Christ, or King. And since Jesus is King, the Father, the Ancient of Days, gives him a kingdom in Daniel 7, 14. But the kingdom of Jesus is unlike any other kingdom there ever was, is, or will be. Because not only does the kingdom of Jesus consist of persons from all peoples, nations, and languages, it will also never pass away. It will never be destroyed. It's never just going to stop one day. It is an everlasting kingdom. It is a kingdom of saints according to Daniel 7 18. But how is this kingdom built and what is a saint? Well again that parallel passage in Revelation 5 Verses 8 through 13 helps us out here. Revelation 5, 8 through 13, if you want to read it with me. Uh, great passage of scripture. Revela oh, they're all great. I can say it every single time I look at a passage of scripture. It's all, it's all great. But Revelation 5, 8 through 13 says this. Now when he had taken the scroll, this is talking about Jesus, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, then I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb forever and ever. And so in God the Father's master plan, His Son, the God-man, King Jesus, is also the Lamb of God and takes away the sin of the world. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So you and I deserve to die because we have disobeyed our Creator, but 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so even though Jesus is sinless and didn't deserve to die, he chose to die, to take your punishment and my punishment upon himself. And then Jesus rose again to defeat death. Romans 6, 5 says, If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And to receive this free gift, Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you shall be saved do that and Ephesians 2.19 says you're a saint you're a saint you're a citizen of God's kingdom you're a member of the household of God and this is the most important message we will be sharing during vacation Bible school this week as we do Kingdom Chronicles, a very fitting uh, vacation Bible school with a very fitting passage of Scripture. But I do want to end with the question, are you part of the kingdom of God? Let's pray.